Do you really know where your food comes from? Today I'm at Two Rose, the Northwood side of North Bradford, to dig a little deeper. We're going to chat with Will, and he's going to show us around. He's going to give us a little history about Chicarellis, and tell us a little bit about farming, the how-tos, the what-tos, and the what-not-tos. So, let's go in and take a peek. So this here is the shrubberies that we renovated after we picked them to uh, come back for next year. So shrubberies are, are a perennial crop. And uh, once you establish the row, once you establish the row and the plant the first year, you got three, four, five years to pick off. And so after you plant them the first year, the second year, uh, you get to pick off them after you pick them. You just mow them down as close as you can to the ground. It's called renovation. Sometimes you, sometimes you could use a um, a disc to cut them to narrow them up if they're too good, uh, if they're growing too much. Uh, but here we just mowed them. And they're coming back for next year, so we so you see they're turning green. So we mow them, we fertilize them, and then we obviously this year we've been watering them, and you can see out there that that water that water is done. And this machine here just slowly walks across the field and waters it. Oh, is that and what this is? Yeah. That, that machine pulls out about uh, 380 feet, and then at the end there, that gun shoots another uh, like 145 foot circle. So it waters in 145, 145 feet and a 270 degree circle, and it pulls itself in time. You hear it clicking, you know. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah all those times that makes it roll in just a certain distance. So we know we're putting down three quarters of an inch every time that plant goes out and comes in. Oh, every time we pull it out, it pulls itself back in and puts out three quarters of an inch of water on that area, which is a lot of water. That thing's putting out 450 gallons of water a minute. Wow. It takes six hours to run back. So you figure, you know, there's, there's a lot of water there, do the math. Wow. It's running six hours, puts out 450 gallons a minute. Wow. And now, so this is watering not only the strawberries. It's watering this whole section of strawberries to those other potatoes, and it's watering this whole section of potatoes. So then we pull it all back in, we move it down another driveway and a half, and we pull it back out, and then we run it again. Okay. So we just keep moving it back and forth, and we've been doing this for two weeks now because it's not raining, so. Wow. I mean, it's just another addition to the price, the cost of doing business. Right. Uh, the pump that's pumping it is actually a, is actually an old retired fire truck, which is very fuel which is very fuel efficient compared to other engines. We okay. Used to, we used to pump water to this thing with a, a, a gas engine that used 15 gallons of gas an hour. Wow. 15 gallons of gas an hour. Wow. And we moved to the fire truck here that now burns just under four gallons of diesel fuel an hour, but pumps out tremendous water, a very hardly working idle and and there's other stuff watering off of that at the same time. Wow. Which we weren't able to do before. So the potatoes over here. Yes. There's actually four. There's actually four acres of potatoes. So just so, uh, just for some easy calculations, uh, when we get these potatoes to plant four acres of potatoes, mm -hmm. we need. We used uh, just around. Uh, 7,500 pounds of potatoes. Oh wow! They come in. They come in big. They come in these big, what are called bulk bags or sling sacks. Okay. They come from uh, Prince Edward Island, and uh, there's 2,500 pounds in a the bag. And they, they're taller than you. Wow. They're, yeah, just about as tall as you. <laughs> and then we plant. We plant. You plant a potato. It's not a plant or a, or, or a true seed like you would plant in the ground. To grow potatoes, you, you need what, what we call seed pieces, which is just a potato that has eyes on it. So it's just like when you go to the supermarket and you buy potatoes and you stuff them in the cabinet. Six months later, you pull them out and, and they, they have like all they're the growing. Right, right. Well, that's what we do. We get them in these swing sacks and they're just about ready to to to, to, um, to get eyes on them. And we do the, there's another thing you could do called chitting potatoes where you just lay them out and let them sit and they, as soon as they sprout then you throw them in the ground you know they're going to grow because they're already sprouted um. Um, so these were planted every 12 inches can we go closer yeah there's um the rows are 36 inches apart okay as you can see and uh 
they're 36 inches apart and there's a there's a there was a seed piece potato there was a seed piece put every 12 inches wow and there's three different varieties 2500 pounds of each in that there's a, a red variety with yellow uh, a red variety with white flesh um, a yellow skin with white flesh and a yellow uh, a yellow fleshed uh, potato and it, it's actually a project with Yale Yale Sustainability and um, Yale's Food Service. We started it about four years ago. What they wanted to do was get a product that could be grown as close to Yale as possible. And the the constraints with selling to schools is schools are are in when we're out and we're out. You know? Right. So opposite seasons. Opposite seasons. Right. So one, uh, you know, potatoes store a little better. So. You know, they they get things like the tail end of tomatoes, winter squash, and what else do you have? Potatoes or greens. Right. So this project was between the Seed Piece Company, which is this HPZ company. It's the largest seed potato company in the world, Yale and myself. So, wow. you know, it's kind of a community effort. And Very I cool. plant them and grow them. And unfortunately, it's so dry this year that we're running water. But I could put I could put the water on. Right. I can't take the water off in the rain, so I'd rather have that. We have I'd rather have this. It. Okay. Than that. Okay. Um, okay. Although it's 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 although it costs more money and sometimes it's, it's, it's unnerving. I mean, the, these potatoes don't look as good as they could look if we had rain, but they look better than they would look if it rained every day. You know, they Got would be it. dead. Okay. Then they'd, they'd get some sort of disease or okay. or die and. That would be the end of them. Because so, they'd be overwatered. Yeah, they it's just disease city when it's when it's wet and humid. Okay. Uh, as opposed to dry and humid. When it's wet and humid, you've got all kinds of diseases that fester out there that just when they bloom, they bloom and they, they'll take out whole fields, you know. Right, right. Um, wow. But these these guys are coming along good. They've made it pretty far in their life. Potato um, although the plant looks a little rugged on the top, some of them, uh, there's a lot of potatoes underneath. Um, and they will size up as the plants really, they, they, they're self-terminating, the plants. And when a plant self-terminates, you know, um, you it's better to leave them be in the ground. That the, the potatoes will actually heal over better and store better. So we could pull potatoes out now and we call them new potatoes, which I'll pull up a plant here in a minute so you can see it. We would call those new potatoes. The skin's very soft on them. They need to be used within a couple of days. Right, okay. Or, or at least, you know a week maybe maybe a little more because the skins aren't healed they're not storage ready okay. so we, we want these fields to self-terminate so they're actually in, in good shape for that right now awesome so um when we plant these potatoes when we plant these potatoes we put that so like i said we put that seed piece every uh every 12 inches and that's what come out of one seed piece that's the plant from one seed piece and then that's how the potatoes oh, grow. That. So that's the potatoes come off the roots and then they set tubers. And those are the tubers. Those are the new tubers. This here is something that usually doesn't happen a lot. This is the tuber we planted. Oh. Okay. So the potato uses the energy, which is the starch, to grow. So that potato didn't use any of its very little of its energy or starches it just started to grow and then it grew roots and it nourished itself off of the roots not the potato so we can actually stick this potato back in the ground and it will grow no kidding and then you see there's actually some you know some potatoes broke off and that's probably it so that's about the area you see about how big the area that these grow right and that's a phenomenal tuber set on any potato for anybody. Unfortunately, um, you know, with the weather being dry, they, these would be much bigger, much, much bigger. So that's why we're treating, trying to keep them, you know, in the best of shape, let them get bigger. Right. Let them heal off good. So that's that's a potato wow. for your that's potato beautiful. fest. Yeah. And this here, if you look at this, mm -hmm. It, there's a little that that's from heat of this the, the tremendous heat we had last week okay it, it starts to put off a secondary tuber root but they'll uh -huh. be fine it's just really you know these edges wow this was on the edge got really hot right right 
Well, and then the, normally That's you don't pick them. You have a machine that comes through. Yeah, we have a machine that comes through. And uh, the machine that comes through um, goes underneath them. And it's a chain, then they walk up a chain conveyor that shakes the dirt and Connecticut shakes the rocks out and then deposits the big rocks and potatoes behind the machine because it's Connecticut. You can see all the field stone we have. And right. Then, then we come through uh, by hand and we pick, uh, we pick them up and put them in buckets. And then we bring them back to the barn. And then in the barn, which is still away right now, is um, Cato Grader that actually takes these by the size, um, it's got a size chain, so it drops them off different parts of the, of the machine, okay. and then uh, the person stands at that part of the machine and bags them, so that they're, uh, they're sized out. Oh, they're sized okay. out, but they're not trashed out. So they're sized out, and then they're still picking, they're still watching as they fall to grab out something that might have got cut and broken, stepped on, or whatever. Right. And there's probably some people around there still remember doing it. If, if there was a lot of people up north. And, Northern Connecticut, but in Maine, they always talk. You always talk about potatoes in Maine and all these things, and you can see videos. They they actually shut down schools. Then I don't know if they're still doing as much as they did. And then all the kids from the town would go out and pick up potatoes. No kidding. They would all get chips, different colored chips, like you know, like bingo chips or you know, bingo chips. Yeah, we know bingo and slot machine chips, but those right. kids know about chips that they work with. So. They all get a different chip and you fill up these barrels. They're actually 56, they're big barrels and they stand this tall. They run around, fill them barrels up, those kids work hard and they come along with a truck that has a special machine that slings them up on the, right up on the truck. As you pick those, those barrels, they hand you the chip and at the end of the day, you hand your chip and you get paid. Oh, no kidding. Very cool. And that's the whole, I mean, that, that's, that's it. That's, that's how a lot of people harvest. Now they're, you know, the harvester machines harvest them into, into trucks and stuff. It's big, it's big business, but still some of them small farms up there still do that. Still doing it like that. Which, mm -hmm. The mass to the potatoes, the mass to the madness of the potatoes is, which in a perfect, in a perfect setting, in a perfect condition, in perfect growing weather, you know, perfect everything, which we haven't had this year. Although the potatoes didn't grow good at the beginning of the season, there should be, that 7,500 pounds of seed should turn into 125,000 pounds of potatoes. Okay, wow. So you figure, you know, the normal bag you guys buy in the store is either three or five pounds. So right. do the math of how many thousands of bags are here. Yeah, it's a lot of potatoes. What? That's a lot of potatoes. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> so they, they, well, I pick these and, and clean, not clean them totally. I just, I just bag them up to send out and then they're taken by another, um, they're taken to a, um, a processing facility, which then processes them for Yale. So they, they can either get washed and shipped whole, they okay. can get washed and shipped cubed, diced, cut, oh, right. whatever, okay. whatever Yale asks for, they're theirs. When I harvest them, then we're going to start shipping them. We can ship them as fast as possible. Okay. And that's the potatoes. Very cool. And here are the actual photos of them in production. Look at all those potatoes. And here they are picking them up and putting them into the baskets, just like Will said. One row filled one bin, which is equivalent to 1,000 potatoes. Off to the potato corn fest. Well, I mean, you can see just by looking why we refer to this as God's country up here. Yeah. Because it is. Mm -hmm. And about a, what? At least 180 degree view of north, northwest. We don't get the perfect sunsets here, but we get the perfect sunrise. Cause oh, cool. That way, but, um, and then from here, you're overlooking uh, Rosa Bianca's vineyard, mm -hmm. which you can see from 17. Um, you can just barely see the top of the mill pond, which has been there since the 60s. The building and right. the restaurant, you know, it's been done over there. And, Another one you spent a lot of time and money and hard work and right. over the top of the mill pond you can see the other part of this farm which is there's over there there's uh there's sixty six acres of um, state protected farmland over there that is um 
It's deeded to always be farmland, so the state owns the deed um, to develop it, which they will never develop it. It's just a program. They, it's a program that came about in the state to protect farmlanders. They, they protected over 400 farms, hundreds of thousands of acres all across the state of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So this farm we're standing on and that farm are both protected. This is 50. There's 66 acres over there and 50 something over there. Uh, it works out to 133 acres between two pieces. Okay. okay. And a piece on old posts, which a lot of people drive by and know of. Right, right. Because they drive by it. Right. And then, you know, that piece is set behind the restaurant, so people sometimes don't realize that. But that, you know, there's 66 acres over there. There's 40, there's 40 of it inside of a, of a deer containment fence that, oh. um, because the deer used to be so bad over there that we couldn't grow anything. So in, in, uh, in 19, uh, 2000, 99, 2000, we put up a deer fence over there. The fence in 40 acres, there's miles and miles of fence over there. Wow. And uh, you can see from here, the green, the green you can see, that green patch is uh, actually field corn that we're hoping to cut into a corn maze for the fall. Oh, cool. And then behind that, you can see some few rows of things. Those are, uh, that's a, a little pumpkin patch, hopefully have a, a corn maze mm -hmm. through the corn into the pumpkin patch so you can get your pumpkins and, you know, have some entertainment value out of it. And then off to the left of that, on this side of the, on the left-hand side of the driveway over there, you can just see the corner, just the corner of the tomatoes. Um, That's the darker green. Yeah, it's a darker green. So on the right side of the driveway, there's only six acres. On the left side of the driveway, there's 30. There's the, um, not quite, there's about 22 acres over there that have vegetables on them. Because there's, there's some, there's some hay land. Side? Yeah. Oh, yeah, think about it. You, you yeah. All you see really is, you see six acres and a little bit that goes over the hill. There's 10 on this side. If there's 40 inside, there's 30 on this side, I'm right? I'm back here somewhere. And, you know, there's a little bit of hay on this side. It's not quite uh, an acre. And okay. then there's, you know, the edges of the field. And there's another spot that's about an acre and a half or two acres right. that we're trying to make into a, um, we're trying to get it into a, uh, a pollinator habitat. So oh. it was a, it was a steeper part of the field that was harder to farm. Instead of farm it, and, and I, I just, you know, we've decided that it'd be better to leave it that for a pollinator habitat. So there's, there end up being almost two acres over there mm -hmm. on the pollinator habitat because this time of year it's, you know, it's dirt country. And part of the reason why there's big, um, bigger sections here because we plant the different 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 wildflowers. And the one thing you don't see anywhere on this farm here is that we uh we rent another 40, 45 acres to grow sweet corn on because sweet corn is, is land consuming. Mm -hmm. So in order to grow the sweet corn I rent land from a dairy retired dairy farmer in town of Wallingford. So here you won't see the sweet corn that we grow but if you do go through Wallingford, you'll see it, especially if like, you're on Reeves Gap, in Reeves Gap and Rowan Hill, where it crosses there, South Grand Road. Oh, yeah. And so we grow, this year we got uh, just shy of 40 acres, which, yeah. 40 acres, it should be like nine or, nine, ten, nine to 10,000 bags of corn, probably like 60 years in the bag, so. And so that all goes where the, the potatoes, all of the, the potatoes are the potatoes are really most of that scheduled to go to Yale, but okay. I mean that's going to get in the food system because they can't use all that. So where it goes from there, it was probably going to go to a wholesaler in Hartford, and then he's he's going to ship it out. And then I got some people that come in here that got stands that want a bag of this and bag of that because I also have a half an acre of those potatoes are mine, which is enough for me right. and my people. So you know they'll come in and get a bag of this one, a bag of that one. And then, um, when you say you and your people, you mean my, my customers that come to me? Right, right. Yeah. So, so first and foremost, my CSA. Right. They they get first crack at everything. Mm -hmm. And then once once I, once I've given it out to them, then I offer it out to my wholesale customers based on who who would use it. Right. And then I take from them. So like I don't offer. The, I go, I go to, you know, big, all the local big wide, so I don't offer the potatoes to big wide because I don't wash them and I don't bag them the way they use them. So mm -hmm. I don't bag them in three pound plastic bags. Right, and that's right. the way they sell them. So 
I short myself out of a market because of packaging, but to be able to do that packaging, I can never get the money for that that part of the market. Right. So what's the sense of doing it? It's, it, you know, some other, th there's, there's some things like that, like uh, like beans. I grow green beans that are hand-picked. I can't sell a green bean for less than $50 a bushel now. Mm -hmm. And I should still probably be getting $60 a bushel. So I can't hand-pick a bean, put it in my box, and then go tell certain customers, oh, it's 50 or $60, because they got channels and avenues to get stuff in mass quantities a lot less money so I, I you know my customer i know which customer uses what and what wants what so when i grow beans i only grow enough to go to the to, to the customers that come to me that only use one or two so uh, other things i grow beets swiss chard cabbage kale all those types of things same thing they go to the csa customers first when i have excess i sell it off to whoever wholesale wants to buy it with some of those things i can go to big wise i go to wholesalers the cabbage and all and Swiss chard on it. They sell it the way I package it. Corn. The sweet corn. And what with the, the tomatoes are, uh, and then we grow tomatoes, which I, I really like to grow tomatoes. Um, they're a little more time consuming to pick. We pick them, we bring them to the barn. They go across the machine that sizes them, and then the girls grade them out for size, uh, for color, and a little more size wise. So when you see our box of tomatoes, they're all laid in there perfectly. They look beautiful and um, when I sell you a product it's got my pride in it and it's it, it, I guarantee you that you will get more out of my package in the end yeah so be it you can go buy a box of squash or a box of tomatoes somewhere else two or three dollars cheaper but if you throw one or two of them out or two or three pounds of it out where are you at I got peppers and eggplant and uh, my fancy heirloom tomatoes squashes cucumbers so we got enough here you know i got i got 11 acres of tomatoes over there 11 acres of tomatoes is um yeah we're near the 40 45,000 plant range wow well you know that's mixed uh, you know uh, uh, heirloom tomatoes grape tomatoes cherry tomatoes brown tomatoes plum tomatoes that's a lot of that's a lot of tomatoes. Eleven acres. That's a lot of tomatoes. Yeah, that's a lot of tomatoes. It, it covers eleven acres, but it covers eleven acres. But one thing I did, which you can see here, is uh, if you look at the rows, if you look at the rows from headland to headland, which is the long way, um, there it looks like every other row is missing compared to some other farming practices, which it is, and I did that on purpose. I started that a few years ago because we were getting these tremendous rains and then I, you know, driving around the fields, you would see soil, topsoil moved because these plastic rows are like the roofs of a house and the walkways are like gutters. So we would get a two-inch rainstorm and you, the volume of water coming out those gutters or walkways, low spots, was tremendous because it's coming off of those rows. So you're, it's just like a gutter or storm drain, anything. And, and it was it was washing topsoil to the ends of the fields, out the fields, the gully washes. So I said, enough of this. I'm gonna take out every other row and I'm gonna seed uh, an intensive cover crop where that row should have been. So I'm gonna help my land by, by using a cover crop that's eventually gonna add uh, organic matter to the soil mm -hmm. and then every other row so now I've lessened by 50 percent the amount of water coming out the end of the rows mm -hmm. so if you look at my rows like if you look at these right here and turn around you can see how it goes there's a couple tall weeds at the end for sure right. but the lighter brown stuff is a cover crop called oats and in that you can't see the row of plastic I let the oats grow up because we've already picked them there was lettuce there so the oats grow up I seeded those right on the edge of the plastic. They grow up, and now they're actually going to reseed. Their seed's going to fall down and regrow. Okay. And um, but that that cover crop did not interfere with any of the growing of the plant that was in there, the lettuce plant. So now that's holding the soil back from getting washed away. And then in between that section's all cover crop with uh, red clover and oats and some other stuff. And then when we till that back in, now I take out this row and I grow where I cover crop next year. And that'll eventually give me the rotation that we need to unused land, which is better for a farmer, which 
it's hard in Connecticut because there's not enough there's not enough usable land, not enough farmable land, especially like in Northford. I mean, we're a community now, and there's not as much land as there was 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I've cut my production down 50% on my land, but I hope and to gain back, even if I gain back only 25% in the next year, mm -hmm. I'm still better off in the long run. And then the soil's better off, the climate's better off, the farm river is better off. It's not because I'm killed keeping all that silt and stuff back. I mean, it, it sounds, I mean, it might sound ridiculous, but from here to the river, it's only 2,000 feet. Mm. You know, the river's right at the bottom of the valley, the farm river. So okay. to have all that impact taken away from the farm river helps water supply. Mm. I'm I mean, doing my little part. Everybody else got to do their little part. Okay. I do my little part. You know, everybody else steps in and does their little part. Maybe, I don't know. Yeah, we could, we could take we a little could, chunk out. Yeah, we could take a little chunk out. And the Farm River is the most heavily impacted river that directly goes to a water supply in the state of Connecticut. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, because it's short. It only starts at White Hollow, right? right. It starts just north of White Hollow, maybe Durham, okay. just south Durham. It only goes to Lake Saltonstall. That's not that far. Mm -hmm. And think about how much is on this river the whole way. Not just me, just everybody all the way down. Right. So when it gets to Saltonstall, it's one of the it's one of the most impacted rivers that leads to a public water source. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole farm river thing. You know, we, we try we respect everything that's we respect everything that's put in front of us we don't we don't do anything off color here and like i said we're trying you see these practices we're trying to right right and the other thing with what i'm doing there even though there's a lot of plant load on that ground mm -hmm. since it's covered it's actually more you're i'm actually better off in a drought because that land is covered Open soil is the worst thing for a drought because it's it, it just like us plants and plants in the ground they sweat. Right. So if your if if your ground is covered by plant matter, which all mine is, it's actually better for uh, for drought situations. And some of those are drought tolerant. Like um, red clover is a drought tolerant plant. Huh. And when we get to our cornfields, which you're not going to see in this video, we have a special. Um, special machine that just tills the section that we're putting the, the corn seed so there's a tilled strip and an untilled strip and a tilled strip and an untilled strip and that too was cover crop and that strip is is, is tilled instead of across the field from edge to edge that strip is tilled straight down so the roots have nothing but soft soil to grow through which if you plow to edge to edge you only have about this much soft soft top soil so you get to a thing called plow pan or, or hard pan, which is just below the soil, which is rock hard, over 300 PSI to get through it. And roots only grow to 180 PSI. That's all they have. Most roots only have the strength to fracture that. Mm -hmm. So our cornfields right now, compared to other cornfields around the area, are look like, wow, they must be watering them. But we're not, because our roots are able to go down to the subsoil. Right. And we feed them down below the subsoil, so there's no food on top. It's all down. So we we work off of like a prescription. We feed our plants. We don't feed the soil. Right. Other, you know, commercial agriculture from the late '40s was feeding the soil, and now we're feeding the plant, not the soil. So we're going in the reverse. So hopefully, it took us. It, it, you know, it took commercial agriculture 60 years to destroy the planet. Some of us are trying to work in the other direction, right. which is good. I mean, the dust bowl, all that stuff, you know, um, people might have learned their lesson, but they don't always learn their lesson. Right. Some people have to get burned twice by the stove, not just once. Right. And then, same thing, if we're just feeding our plants, then we don't have runoff and we don't have discharge and all that stuff. So that's, that's who we are and what we do. Awesome. Yeah. And we, yep. Yeah, awesome. Try to be good. Yep.
They are. Good neighbors. We got good neighbors here. All good neighbors. Yeah, that's a good thing. So the story behind the farm is um, the Ciccarelli family owns still still owns some you know the farm. Mm -hmm. um, it was bought first by the grandfather Frank Ciccarelli, and he ran it with his wife and his sons. And, they had a successful farm. And that was that that, when? That was from 1912 mm -hmm. until the 60s when he passed away. And then his sons ran it right. for a long time until the 90s when they figured out, you know, what are we going to do? We got, you know, family members are getting old, family members want out. How can we make it fair for everybody and how can we save the farmland? So a couple of them got together. And that's how they got to sell and develop rights to the state of Connecticut. So that it protected the land to be farmland forever. Everybody knew it was going to be farmland forever. They restructured the business. The next generations moved up and were helping then. And then, you know, the older generations subsequently retired or passed away. And then it moved on to what would be the third generation, which was Nelson. And he ran it from uh, 96. And I was I worked with him since then until he got sick in 2017 and passed away in 2000, January 2018. So it, he wanted his farm to go on. For, he wanted his farm to go on. So that's what we, that's what we did. So um, between his wife and I, we ran the farm for two years. And then it's, it's, you know, it's a lot of work to run a farm. So December 2019, January 2020, we decided that I would run the farm as my business. Mm -hmm. You know, she still retains the rights to the land. She owns the land. Mm -hmm. And I'm running the farm as my business and I'm the land. So, you know, hopefully it, it could be the farm he wants forever. And that's what we're trying to do. And um, I, you, you could see the place is beautiful and mm -hmm. I try to keep it that way. And, you know, we did a lot of, we did a lot of stuff together. We, all the stuff um, that he started and we started and we did together changing the farm from you know what it was you know farming um, because there was a lot of manpower with his uncles so they had less mechanization and less modern age stuff because they like doing it the way they knew how to do it and all farmers are that way they like to do it the way they know how to do it or they've done it so um, a lot of the things we've done around here, the plastic culture with the drip irrigation, the fence for the deer, mm -hmm. the zone tiller for the corn, mm -hmm. that's all stuff, and you know, other improvements, uh, underground irrigation lines we did together, we, we built a, a packing, a little packing facility without a cooler, outgrew that in no time, then we built a bigger packing house with a cooler, which we outgrew before we even started using it, but we had to take baby steps. So, and we grew from, you know, delivering like old school on backs of trucks with, you know, slinging sacks off one at a time to go into enclosed refrigerated trucks with pallets and stuff like that. So, you know, and then we were running a goddamn successful farm, one of the mm -hmm. biggest vegetable farms in the area and one of the biggest ones in the state. And then, you, you know, you, you, he always used to talk about the tape measure. And the tape measure, you got to figure how long you think you're going to live. So if you're going to live till you're 80, just hold from zero to eight and figure where you are. You know, and he never guessed that 63 is going to be. So when, you know, there were some other things we were going to do, but that got put on the back burner because everything got changed. But so with the plastic rows being separated and reoriented and changed and that stuff that I did after I got took over the farm because I think that's something he would have was something he would have wanted he still had the erosion problems I was talking of and he hated them too we all hated them and we did everything we could and so that's why working with the USDA on some of these other projects we were able to work on that project too and that project was reoriented the rows in some fields so that it was um less conducive to runoff or 
actually, they're, one of them is swaled. It's contour plowing, which you don't see, contour farming, which you don't see in Connecticut because it's actually a West Coast thing or, or, or Midwestern, but not so much on the East Coast. But anyways, and with that, there's there's drainage ditches and diversions that are rock lined so that that, uh, that the water slows down so it doesn't rush off the farm. So, you know, we, we did that on one field and instead of cover crop in one whole field every year, which we never got around to because we get really busy. So now these middles, I have to take care of them because they're in the middle of what I'm doing. So it's like, you can't you can't not take care of it. It's, listen, there's been stumbling blocks. I'm, I'm not gonna say that everything's been perfect because it's not been perfect, but I learned a lot over the past three or four years about what to do and what not to do. And sometimes it just simply comes down to not having the time to do what you should be doing. So you gotta do what you need to do, but not so much what you should be doing. It gets to be, it gets to be a pain in the ass, but it's just, it, it, it's farming and that's that. I mean, it's what it is. Yeah, it, it is what it is. So basically, I mean, the farm business is ever evolving, you know? There was, there was customers we were selling a lot to 10 years ago. You know, we were selling them a lot of stuff that I'm not selling them too much stuff anymore because they've had people pass away and their families and their businesses got smaller or um, the price they offer at one place it may not be as good as the next place. I've, I've grown this program with Big Y. I've partnered a lot with um, Connecticut Food Bank. So uh, the, the farm is, sales is ever progressing in different directions. And years ago, there was a lot of little farm stands around. There's not so many this year anymore. And, you know, farm markets were up and evolving late 90s, you know, early 2000s to up to today. Um, they're not the same they were. Uh, people aren't, I'm not sure, you know, people are still shopping them, but there's so many of them. And, and, and we've grown ourselves out of that, that that volume of farming, but there's still people that do. That, that volume is their stepping stone. Maybe someday they'll, Maybe someday they aspire to get as big as this farm, but there's a lot of money that goes into this. Yeah, there should. as long as you love what you do. Yeah, as long as you love what you do, that's what matters. So, matters. Yes. <laughs> I know everything's going up for everybody, but when farmers are so dependent on everything, and you know we're dependent, we're dependent on ev every everything. We, we, you know, we're trucking fuel, uh, fertilizer prices, and everything we do. Is Everything we do is it's just going up. It, whatever percentage, uh, some of them up to 300 percent. And then, I mean, shit. When you were buying beans from us when you were at your restaurant, I think they were probably 28 or 30 bucks. Right. They haven't doubled, but the price of everything since then has doubled. You know, I'm, I tell you, 50 was the number last time, but the, you know, sometimes I can only get 45 on it. And you know everything goes up, but mm -hmm. I don't know. What, well, really, what the general public needs to do, which they can't, uh, I get it, because you could probably go into you could go into any of these stores, whether it be um, whether it be the dollar store, which uh, you shop where you shop, whether it be a, uh, uh, a, a cheaper dollar store or the most expensive. Boutique. Boutique market. Right. Um, if you could spend all your money with us to keep us to survive, we'd all be better off. But uh, I get the fact that you've got to do what you can afford. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can't you can't afford that boutique, you can't afford that roadside stand, and you gotta do the one stop shop. So if that's what you gotta do, that's what you gotta do. But really it would help everybody if you and everybody supported local and I'm it, it's not just it's not just the homeowner it's the homeowner it's the restaurant it's the vineyard it's the Northwood store right. it's the pizza joint and they do a lot of these guys do give us business right. they can't keep they can't buy everything they have that's right. a fact but they buy you know I barter and trade stuff with Charlie for Mill Pond, they're buying stuff, you know, uh, the pizza joints, I know, you know, this one gets tomatoes from this farmer, that one gets tomatoes from that farmer, uh, you know, 
sell a lot of tomatoes to Julie Cow at the deli in North Brantford. Mm -hmm. He comes all the way up here for it. You know why? Because they're good quality. Right. And he wants to support me because I support him. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need. So if, if, if you can just everything, and I, but I understand it's not 100% possible, but if people can, um, if they want to keep looking at these views, then we need the support to keep, keep them there. Right. And it's tough to do sometimes. Together, we all just do our part. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, At the very least, do yourself a favor and get over to Ciccarelli's to check out their farm stand and this outstanding CSA program. I mean, look at all of this beautiful fresh fruit and vegetables. Oh. Will said it best, if we all just do our part, even if it's a small part, every little effort counts. If you're looking to learn a little bit more about North Brantford, subscribe to this channel and give me a ring because I'd love to show you around. I'm Coastal Kim and I'm living the shoreline dream.